Our first mystery place is located in Tanzania. Here, the last true hunters of Africa live. We're meeting Hadzaba Moody, who lived with the Hadzaba in the bush for 10 years. Today, he lives in a village and has learned to speak English. How can I say hello in the Hadzaba language? Can you teach me? Yes. Normally, they have to say Mtana. Oh. Yeah. But click like Mtana. Mtana. Yeah. Mtana. Yeah. <laughs> Mtana. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Okay, I try my best. <laughs> and action. Dana. Dana. We're the first strangers that are allowed to live with this group. Basically, this is a congregation of currently 30 friends who have been roaming the bush for years. The strongest in the village is the boss. And he's chief because he's the one who's killing a lot of animals. Oh. The leader decides the daily chores of his fellow tribe members. But there's no pre-planning. The Hadzaba don't know the concept of time and don't have a calendar either. The Hadzaba live in the here and now. Maybe the reason why they seem to be smiling the whole time. This is the Hadzaba camp. What looks like overturned birds' nests are the makeshift huts of the bush people, built out of branches and grass. As we said, they only have to stay up for a while. How long do they stay in a place like this? They stay in a place like this for one month or two months, and then they move. Why? Because this, they're going to find where they can get in water and the food. A hard life, always on the move. We are asked inside one of the huts of the village. This one is built with a little more attention to detail. The inside, Spartan. There is no furniture at all, only hunting utensils. Then it is time to find some food. And this means going into the savannah, on foot a habitat that the Hadzaba share with lions, hyenas and elephants. Just the thought of fighting a lion armed only with a bow and arrow is not very pleasant, but here they find everything that they need to survive. But what we will be having today is still unclear to us and the Hadzaba. On special offer today, wild honey. It is hidden inside the cavities of the trees. Honey is the only currency of the Hadzava, besides animal hides, and also makes a very special change to the regular diet. I hope there's a lot of honey inside to give my energy back. Backbreaking work for a few drops of honey. Is this honey, the yellow thing? Yeah, Honey is one of the staples in the diet of the Hadzaba. It is also their medicine for a sore throat and when they have a cold. Also, it is the only available sweet in the bush. For a kilo of honey, they can buy a metal arrow peak from passing traders, a handsome price. But today the find is so small that it is immediately eaten up. Whew. It's hard work collecting honey. <laughs> to make up for it, there's also some mbuyu, the fruit of the monkey bread tree. They are bone dry and very sour, but contain 10 times as much vitamin C as oranges. What is this what you're wearing? What is this from? <laughs> Translated, this means it is a trophy from when he killed a baboon. Okay. While the boys are still discussing their bow and arrow skills, the others are already preparing for the hunt. Bushman Nuna is collecting poison for the arrows. The pith of this plant is deadly. But it only kills if it is in a high concentration. Therefore, Nuna boils the juice down for multiple hours until only a black mass is left, the distilled poison. If only a small amount were to enter the bloodstream, it would be life-threatening. But still, Bushman Nuna processes it with his bare hands. Is there a difference if it gets into human blood or animal blood? Mm. 
but for the Hadzaba, it is the only possibility to get hold of larger quantities of meat. Only lions and wildebeest are hunted with poisoned arrows. In smaller animals, the poison would spread too quickly throughout the whole body, and the meat would become inedible. In bigger animals, it is sufficient to cut out the bit where the arrow struck. But today it is too late to go and hunt. This means no dinner. The Hadzaba don't have any money, nor do they stock supplies. They live off what is currently available. Marijuana is available in the bush and is one of the favorite pastimes of the bushman to smoke it. We prefer to leave them to it. Are you going to sleep here too? Yes, I'm going to sleep in here too because in the Hazabe camp you never sleep in yourself because you have to sleep in with Hazabe because protecting you during night. Okay, yeah, what can happen the in the night? Uh, anything can happen, maybe the wild animals such as a hyena can come, you know. They come into the village? Yeah, yeah sometimes they come in the village, so that's why you're sleeping with Hazabe people, you know. Oh. Good. So, under these circumstances, the lack of personal space is not an issue at all. And to make the hard ground more comfortable, there are kudu skins and a roll-up mat. One thing amazes us, we can't see any women anywhere. But this is due to a simple reason. Each sex has their place in the village community as well as set tasks. The women are gatherers, the men are the hunters. There are no marriages among the Hadzaba, but everyone only has one partner at a time. Every couple of years, they switch to someone else. The children can then decide where they want to sleep every day. Then it is time for bed. In front of every hut, there is a fire. It burns for the whole night. This is supposed to substitute for the door and keep wild animals away. A new day is dawning. Today we are accompanying the women. This means picking fruit and fetching water. Immediately we are handed our own shopping basket. For about 80% of the day, the women gather food. Fruit and roots are always in existence in the bush. They are a relatively secure food supply. <laughs> this one? Ah, uh, okay. Berries are ripe at the moment, so there is no tiresome digging for roots. The girls are pretty hungry. First, it is time to eat, then to gather. They only ever take as much as they need for one day. The lower part of the tree is empty now, but the Hadzaba ladies grudge no pains to reach the rest of the berries too. With almost acrobatic skill. About 1,000 Hadzaba still live in northern Tanzania. There have never been any conflicts about food as the Hadzaba only ever pick what they need. They never exploit nature, so there is always food available. Storing supplies doesn't make sense to the Hadzaba. Yes, it would save them long walks, but storing food would also bind them to one place for longer periods of time, and this is in complete opposition to their lifestyle. In the dried-out riverbed, the women now dig for water. Half a meter beneath the surface, the sand starts to get moist. But water, as opposed to food, is always scarce, especially during the dry season. Therefore, it is used exclusively for drinking and once in a while for cooking. For body care, it is far too valuable to the Hadzaba. Ah, okay. Formerly, the Hadzaba used to fill their water into ostrich eggs. Today, they use a plastic canister. Their clothing, too, is not only made from animal hides anymore. Fabrics and T-shirts are bartered for with passing traders. Back in the camp, the gatherers are already longingly awaited, especially by the children. They too eat the berries raw. Cooking rarely happens. 
But despite the uncooked food and the hard physical work, the Hadzaba never suffer hunger. Tomorrow it will be time to go and hunt, but before that the arrows need to be made, and this takes hours. The mouth functions as the tools. First, the wood is warmed by the fire. Then, bite by bite, it is shaped. In theory, this looks pretty easy, but it is not at all. Unfortunately, you can't aim with a crooked arrow, and this means no prey. The spontaneous concert seems to be appreciated. <laughs> In the early hours of the evening, the relaxed mood is suddenly over with. The reason are the herdsmen from the neighboring Maasai tribes that keep entering the tribal territory of the Hadzaba. Their herds destroy the vegetation and scare away the wild animals. Especially the younger tribesmen are slowly losing their tempers. <laughs> Because the Hadzaba are traditionally not warriors, a dilemma. So can you imagine one day to have cattle and uh, goats by yourself? Most of the Bushmen never learnt to read or write, so there are slim chances to go to court over the territorial dispute. While more and more nature reserves are created around them for the animals, the Hadzaba are left with nothing. No one fights for the protection of their territory. The next morning, it is time to go and hunt with the traditional headwear of the Hadzaba. Normally, no one may accompany the expert hunters on their expedition. The hunters separate into groups. Some have run into the thick bushes, others are on the watch. By whistling, they communicate with each other. Suddenly, everything happens very fast. The Hadzaba have their prey in their sights. Almost anything that they find is regarded as prey, be it a baboon, a lion, or an elephant. Everything except hyenas. This is because the Hadzaba don't bury their dead, they place them in the savannah. And as hyenas are scavengers, the Hadzaba think that if they ate them, they would not only be eating hyena meat, but also their ancestors. It's hard to see if it was a hit. On a hunt, it is all or nothing. If nothing is caught, there is no food. A squirrel. It was hit, but it isn't dead yet. Small animals are hunted with unpoisoned arrows. The arrow is removed. And the neck is bitten through. Who shot this? Did you shoot it? Oh. Unbelievable, yeah. But the hunt isn't over yet. Maybe they will be able to make the big catch. We continue deeper into the savannah. But before we can put tension on our bow, the next animal has already been caught. Yeah, he got it. It is a bush baby, a kind of monkey. But for the moment, it is still stuck in the tree. The shooter has to climb up. In situations like these, accidents often happen. More than 10 people from this group have died while hunting. The next hospital, a couple of days walk away. The Hadzabe themselves only know traditional medicines. Immediately, a fire is made. A part of the prey is always eaten right away because hunting is exhausting and the men need energy. And they don't lose any time while cooking either. Not even the fur is removed. But the catch today is so small that not even the women will get a share. What will the women say when you come without meat? But this is a lie. Oh. 
Meat is a nice protein bonus, but isn't necessary for survival to the Hadzaba. First, the successful hunters get the best pieces. Then what is left goes to the rest of the group. Big prey such as buffalo or wildebeest is only caught every two to three weeks by the Bushmen nowadays. Soon, nothing will be left of this camp. The Hadzaba will move on to a new area. They themselves worry very little about the future. If you have no concept of time and don't live by a calendar, you don't plan ahead by a couple of years. It's all about the now. And at the moment, they are fine. And so we leave the Hadzaba and travel on to the USA, to a place near Colorado Springs. Here, the probably most important US military base is located, the Cheyenne Bunker. Countless myths surround this place. Supposedly, the US president would come here in a worst case scenario. Even aliens are said to be hidden here. Although we are still a whole mile away from the bunker entrance, security seems to know about every single step we make. We have an appointment, but we are not allowed to film in front of the barrier. Then we are issued a pass and may enter. From the Cheyenne bunker, the US Air Force monitor the security of the United States. But how? Will we be able to make it to the US Air Force's most secret room in the end? In front of the entry gate, we are meeting Commander Stephen Rose, the director of the Air Force. We are excited to meet this powerful man who also has access to the most secret room in the mountain. Only accompanied by him are we allowed to continue. Okay, we were expecting someone a bit more impressive, but Commander Rose is our key to the most secret room in the mountain. He has been working for the military for 30 years and began his career at the US Ministry of Defense, the Pentagon. Here in the Rocky Mountains, the US Air Force has a very specific mission to monitor the security of the United States. Never before was a camera team allowed to enter their most secret room, the control center. But that is exactly what we want to get to see. The way of getting there is complicated. Go in and do our security process okay. now, so we'll have to stop filming because we're we going to some We cannot continue high, filming here. Not for so, this is a top secret facility, some high security procedures, so we're going to have to stop cameras and do the right thing for our security. Okay. Security check. We're familiar with those by now. And then we find ourselves in front of probably the most secure entry gates in the world. Since the Cold War, they have always been open, with one exception, the 11th of September, 2001. And today, Commander Rose makes a special exception for us. You should experience it. Okay, I So, will. good luck. Meaning, we are going to be locked in in between the 46 tons of steel of the gate. There's no going back now. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> It only takes 45 seconds for the doors to be completely shut. The location and the place are perfectly chosen, the maximum distance to all coasts. Enemy bombers would have a long way to go. In case of an emergency, this would mean enough time to batten down the hatches. And as you see around us here is the most homogenous piece of granite that they found on the Rocky Mountains, big enough and solid enough to, to to drill into. It's solid granite all the way around us. On our tour through the bunker, we're being followed every step of the way. The three guards on the right-hand side of the frame are watching whom and what we are filming. Apparently, 500 people work inside the complex, but we see almost nobody who specifically works here is supposed to be kept a secret. In case of an emergency, all the employees would have to move into the bunker. But what about the rumors that the military is hiding aliens here? 
Just where the aliens are. See if are. you can see through a secret cage where we keep him. Oh, it's green. <laughs> You're fooling me. So, to our total surprise, no aliens in the bunker. Instead, in a worst-case scenario, there would be 500 employees who would have to be taken care of. For this reason, there is a special central water supply system in place here. <gasps> I told you, you would see a lake. Sometimes people will say that there's no water in the lake, so I bring a little stone, because you see the reflection, it looks like it's empty. The freshwater lake? Yeah. How long would it last if there is an emergency case? Uh, we would be able to replenish that drinking water with the chemicals, the chlorine we keep on hand because we have an unending supply of fresh water coming into the mountain. For how many people? Uh, that number is classified. I cannot, uh, I cannot share that number Can with you. Can you give me a tip? Several hundreds. It's several hundreds, okay. Would you be here inside of that? Yes. You take the family with you? Is that allowed? Inside the mountain, no. It's hard, Sorry. isn't it? Isn't For it? friends and family, not allowed for the when the doors are shut. You know, I guess any time you serve in the military, um, you plan for the worst and you hope and pray for the best. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when you plan for the worst, it does put a heavy burden on your shoulders sometimes to think about if it should ever happen for real. Apart from the water supply, electricity is the most important thing for the work in the mountain. We carry on to the heart of the mountain. Step by step, we're getting closer to our goal. We finally want to see what happens in the top secret control room at the most inside point of the mountain. I see it's amazing in here, but still I don't know what is so important to protect it like that. Yes, we can talk about some of them. In this place, the bunker is brought to life. All the electronics from light bulbs to computer networks are supplied with power from here. Power is the lifeblood of the mountain. It is what we do in here, is watch those computers. And without the power, it's dark. As a matter of fact, our, our technicians like to say that without power, it's just a cave. In order to make sure that the computers will work under any circumstances, there are a whole eight generators here. Yeah, don't look, I don't need filming in the window. This in case of emergency, the generators would take over the entire electricity supply within five minutes. On our way to the command center, the brain of the mountain, we discover something unusual. Allow these buildings to bounce. So if there would be a blast. Okay, it looks like a huge trampoline. Yes, so over 1,300 of these springs throughout the complex underneath these buildings. And then, as you can see, looking to down both directions of this cave, the steel never, or the buildings never actually touch the granite walls. They absorb vibrations caused by earthquakes or atomic bombs and keep the building in a sort of floating state. Just like a ship at sea, these would ride out the waves as it shakes. And then the, and the mission then would continue. A mission in which the American Air Force decides about the safety of the United States from here. But where exactly is the secret command center that we are looking for? On our way, we also find very everyday things. This is a supermarket. supermarket yes. You don't need nothing anymore outside. You can just... <coughs> you can During everyday forever. life, there are mainly snacks on offer here. In case of an emergency, calorie-rich astronaut food would be stocked here. Okay, so how long can an emergency case last? I can't actually share that time with you, mm -hmm. uh, but it is several weeks several weeks and that's just, that's uh, the unclassified of what i can say okay um, but the actual time is classified but why it goes towards our war plans uh, okay. number of people how long well, those are all factors in what we can do our capabilities mm -hmm. and that's what uh, our commanders have classified that material f uh, so we don't the bad the bad guys don't under don't, don't understand what our capabilities are okay what he can tell us a suite for the u.s president doesn't exist in the bunker but instead there are a church, a gym, and a restaurant right inside the mountain. So where are we going next? Um, we're going someplace really special now. This is what we call the System Center. Uh, it is a very, very important center here that brings all the data in. 
uh, we have to be very careful because it is uh, real world stuff is going on. If something important happens, we may have to leave very quickly. Oh, okay. So now it is finally time. We are allowed to access the most well-secured part of the bunker. Hundreds of safety precautions and tons of stone just to protect this one room. And we are the first camera team to ever be allowed inside. This is what Commander Rose promises us. But only for a maximum of five minutes. Then we have to leave again immediately without discussion. Okay. We see screens, monitors, and stern faces. Civilian visitors have never been here before. We meet the head of information. Mr. Jeff Robertson. <laughs> okay. Why is it that important that you have to hide it in a mountain? It's like any, any computer network that you want to make sure it's always available. Yeah. You put it in a location that has the best electricity, has the best uh, protection so that you don't have any downtime. Hmm. You know, that there's no damage, natural disasters or anything like that could take that uh, computer network offline, hmm. but it's always available. Hmm. The information from hundreds of satellite images and CCTV cameras is collected here every second, 24 hours a day. Due to our presence, the monitors are frozen at the moment. Everything is top secret. So if, if we detected missile launches that threaten Europe or or uh, any of those locations over there. Uh, we'd share that information immediately, of course, with NATO and our, our allies and our partners. So there's the phone you take and call? Yes. In times of terror and worldwide turmoil, information like this can decide over war or peace. After precisely five minutes, we have to leave the command center again. But still, as the first camera team ever, we were able to explore the secret Cheyenne bunker. And while the secret command center keeps watching over the USA, we leave the mountain and travel on to Piedras Blancas in Costa Rica. In the middle of the thick jungle, our destination lies hidden. The Finca Bella Vista. Matt Hogan and his wife Erica are the founders of this unusual jungle village. In 2007, the two Americans decided to emigrate to Costa Rica from rainy Colorado. Once they had arrived, they began looking for a small plot of land. When we discovered this property, it's a lot bigger than what we really wanted or needed, but it, we wanted to save it from being clear cut. And Erica said, do you remember that Ewok village on Return of the Jedi? Build something like that and our friends will want to come down and build tree houses and yada, yada, yada. And that's how it all kind of came to fruition. And The way to the treehouse community leads us across bridges, down steps, and across 27 zip lines. And this is my favorite part of the day, my morning commute to the house. <laughs> At the moment, there are 26 houses in the Finca Bella Vista, and the number is rising. More and more people, from dropouts to billionaires, want to fulfill their dream of their own treehouse. So this is the first treehouse we built about four years ago, and you can see the plumbing lines going in over here. You can also see the artificial limb attachments that show how we attach to the trees and support the weight and it still allows the three trees to grow and, and allows the structures to move independently if there's wind. It allows the trees to be trees. Many residents only live here for a couple of months per year. The rest of the time, they are rented out to tourists. Opposed to normal tree houses, all comforts are available here, from a fridge to ceiling lights, just like at the Hogan's house. We create our hot water using an on-demand propane heater. And here's our propane cylinder, and you can see where the gas lines are run. We use that for cooking fuel for the oven and the stove, as well as creating the hot water for a hot shower. The treehouse dwellers also use solar power for energy production. And the upstairs is my favorite part of the house. I'm gonna come on up and check it out. One of the best perks of living in a tree house is being able to sleep up in the trees. We have a 360 degree view of the jungle. 
Erica's favorite place is the veranda. Here she observes toucans, monkeys, sloths, a private zoo in her front garden. Matt and Erica are visiting their new neighbors. The Tippies from Colorado only moved in a few weeks ago. And what is the new life 30 meters above the ground like? Oh, absolutely love it. It's, uh, it's interesting though. Uh, you wake up when the, f the forest or the jungle wants you to wake up, not when you choose to wake up. Um, it can be a little noisy at night yeah. uh, with the monkeys and the parrots. But that's what it's like in the jungle. The next exceptional village takes us to Scandinavia. We are traveling through Lapland, 30 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. The village of Batsu is located. It consists of five tent-like wooden houses, so-called lavus. Each lavu is living room, bedroom, and dining room at the same time. The Sami, the natives to Northern Europe, live in them. Lotta Svensson and her husband Tom founded this village 20 years ago. They also own the herds of reindeer that have secured the survival of the Sami for 3,000 years. So every morning I had to feed the reindeers. It's very important for us to do it because uh, we have so much uh, from them. The skin, the fur, the bone, the meat. Originally, the Sami were nomads and traveled through Scandinavia. Today, they only switch between their summer and their winter camp. Uh, in our territory, we have about uh, 2,000 reindeers. So, so uh, now my husband is out and uh, collect them because now we're going to the coast with them for the winter. What looks like an overdimensional birdhouse is the Nyalo, a kind of village fridge. Traditionally, everyone stores their food here in order to protect it from bears and to keep things cool. Inside Lotta's wooden lavu, there is only one single room. It is the bedroom, living area and the kitchen at the same time. This uh, goti is made of wood and uh, on the floor, we have the branches from the birch covered with the reindeer skin to keep us warm and dry. Each Sami village traditionally houses multiple generations of a large family. Yeah, this is um, Suova, is smoked and uh, a little bit cold, and it's typical for Sami. The fire in the middle of the room is the cooking area and the only source of warmth at the same time. The smoke leaves the area via a closable hole in the roof. Lotta is one of about 15,000 Sami in the whole of Sweden. Almost all of them live in regular houses now and the culture of the Sami is being forgotten. And that is exactly what Lotta and her family want to prevent. An ambitious plan, as the traditional lifestyle of the Sami is not very lucrative and full of deprivation. Traditionally, the whole family congregates around the fire in the evenings. Yeah, dinner is the most important part of the day. When we can sit together, we can calm down and we can feel the cozy, the warm inside. From the Arctic Circle, we are continuing to Vilcabamba, to the so-called village of the 100-year-olds in southern Ecuador. What is the reason for the people of this 4,000-strong village to get so old? Scientists have been trying to solve this mystery for years. Medicinal herbs, cosmic energies, or simply good genes. All speculation. Fact is, 60 people over 80 and 5 people over 100 years old live in Vilcabamba. Ten times as many as the worldwide average. One of them is Agostin Charamillo. This year he is celebrating his 100th birthday. Together with Kara Leo, he lives in a house at the edge of the village and has his very own theory for a long life. Yeah, 
este, que es de, de, ya los médicos y los estudiados, y esa agua se toma un vaso. And therefore, according to Agustín, he became a centenario. That is what the over 100 year olds are called here. Ay, qué rico. Psicológicamente y mentalmente está en una lucidez eh, muy buena. Él mantuvo su autonomía, su independencia durante toda, toda su vida. Y realmente el espíritu y las ganas de vivir que tiene eh, son, son hermosas. Eso es lo que te puedo decir, Agustín. Agustín solito ha vivido toda su vida. Agustín es el model senior citizen de Vilcabamba. Always well dressed, charming, physically fit. Although his doctor has prohibited it, he treats himself to a glass of alcohol once in a while, and every day he smokes one of his beloved cigarettes. Y me encuentro muy, muy bien de salud. ¿sí? El organismo, vino uno de un médico de Loja, dice, venimos a, a ver su, cómo anda su salud, este, cuidándose bien. ¿sí? Está tomando unos alimentos buenos, que por eso está permaneciendo el organismo perfectamente en buenas condiciones, como un organismo de un joven. Once a month, Agustín goes for a physical and mental test at the Ecuadorian Center for Aging Research. The scientists believe that good nutrition, lots of physical work, and the complete lack of stress are the reasons for the high ages of the people in Vilcabamba. But these factors are endangered. More and more tourists and immigrants are coming to the village of the 100-year-olds. The quiet village life has already undergone drastic changes. But Agustín keeps cool about all the commotion regarding Vilcabamba. Maybe his calm is the real secret behind his long life. Our journey takes us 1,600 kilometers north to Puno in Peru. At 3,800 meters, the highest shippable lake in the world is located, Lake Titicaca. Here, the descendants of the ancient Uro people live on an island village made out of reeds. Depending on the size, 10 to 12 families live together per village community. Alfredo Mamani has also built an island with his friends. Its size, 500 square meters. That's about the size of two tennis courts. Cada medio año tenemos que este, ponerlo otro. Otra capa. Y en temporada de lluvia, más de dos techos de totora tenemos que poner. No entra agua, porque la totora es impermeable, se hincha. Cuando cae lluvia, se hincha y se cierra bien. Entonces, okay. The Uros pass their knowledge on to their children. Building a house takes one month. From the walls to the roof, everything is made of reeds. Alfredo collects the building material for the reed village twice a week. He doesn't have a motorboat, so he rows up to six kilometers along Lake Titicaca in order to harvest the canes. Because of small air pockets inside of them, severed reeds have a very high buoyance. Alfredo's ancestors discovered this quality of the plant thousands of years ago, and already back then built boats and villages out of reeds. Siempre tratamos de mantener nuestra cultura, la cultura de los puros. Y es por eso que nos gusta vivir así. Para la casa ni para la isla, sino una parte de ella se come. Todo lo que es la parte blanca es comestible, ¿no? Así. Para los niños se pela como un plátano. No sé. It takes the Uros six months to build the unusual village out of reeds. After a few weeks in the water, the reed base begins to rot. Gases come to exist, which give the island buoyance. Para construir una isla, nosotros necesitamos de la raíz de la totora. Este material nosotros tenemos que ir unos 5 o 6 kilómetros lado norte, ¿no? más adentro. Caminos estrechos nos tenemos que meter. Diferentes medidas. The Uros cut the root blocks of the reeds to a height of about 30 centimeters. With ropes, they fasten the blocks together. 
After about three months, they then become one big root. In order for the construction not to float away, stones act as anchors. The floor, two meters of reeds. About one ton of weight is pressing down. One meter's worth sinks down into the water and begins to rot. Then, every three weeks, fresh reeds are placed on top. We leave the reed village in Peru and travel on to Rijeka in Croatia. This ship was already sunk, raised and done up again. It used to be the swimming Air Force One of a dictator and Hollywood stars used to visit it often. We want to take a closer look at it. What is the inside of the mysterious ship like? Which secrets are there to be discovered? So we set off. Somewhere here in the harbour of the Croatian coastal town, the stately yacht of former President Tito is supposed to be moored and in a deep slumber. Yeah. The man's name, who is showing us the way, is called Maciasic Zelko and is actually the captain of the ship. Since 2002, the Galeb has been lying here idle. a 117-meter-long freighter as a stately yacht. This was a luxury that the former president, Josip Broz Tito, enjoyed. With the permission of the captain, we go aboard the Galeb. With the help of a map, we want to find our first destination on the ship, the engine room. Today, nothing is happening here anymore, but in theory, the ship is still seaworthy. Constructed in 1938, this ship is only 26 years younger than the Titanic. And this is not the only similarity. The Galeb was sunk by a fighter plane during the Second World War. It is one of very few ships that sank and was then raised again. After 78 years at sea, the Galeb has not only gotten a bit rusty, but has also collected many interesting stories over time. We continue our search for the traces of these. Next, on the passenger deck. Altogether, the ship has 12 cabins for visitors. Back then, they were very luxurious and came with room service and a butler. Today, the luxury has vanished. The former conference room now simply feels eerie. And yet, the ship has been through a lot. After the death of the communist dictator, it lies moored off the coast of Montenegro and is almost completely plundered by souvenir hunters in the 90s. Clearly, the furniture was worthless to the looters. Where political decisions used to be made, today there is only dust and decay. But as we know, beauty lies in the eye of the observer. The former dance floor, too, could probably tell many a tale of wild parties and of celebrities. For almost three decades, the international jet set enjoyed many wild evenings here. The dictator loved to take show stars aboard his ship. It is said that Sophia Loren also visited the yacht. We find a fully furnished apartment. Tito hates hotels and especially aeroplanes. This is the reason for him using the Galeb as his stately carriage, almost like a Marine Air Force One. Today, the Galeb is a lost place, full of history, lonely, deserted and eerie. In order to get the best shot of this special place, we climb up a 30 meter high mast. But the hatch has rusted up, so no picture from above. The good news, after years of deep sleep, the Galeb is soon going to be overhauled and will be turned into a museum. The ship is part of Croatia's history and has to be preserved for the future. From Croatia, we travel on to Fuzhou in China. There, we find a pretty unusual house. 
It looks like the Chinese version of the Enterprise. The Galactical Building costs $90 million. The spaceship is the headquarters of one of the biggest Chinese companies. But who would build something like this? And what does it look like from the inside? We are greeted by the boss's assistant. First, we enter, well, an empty open space office. So what is happening inside here, inside this office? And how many people work here in, in this enterprise office? In case you were wondering, we are allowed to enter the spacecraft, but only on a Sunday. In China too, Sunday means that there is no work going on anywhere. Normally, the newest Chinese video games are programmed here. The employees are even allowed to make their own hours. A lot of activities also for you as a worker, you're allowed to use this one. The boss's idea, the employees are supposed to live in the complex with their families and feel comfortable here in order to be even more efficient and creative in their work. To realize his idea, he has created a real fun park on China's east coast. For all this, his big inspiration is Google. In the normally strictly hierarchical country of China, this is a rare company concept. The anticipation of meeting the boss in person is growing. We're allowed to go into his office by ourselves. Not even the employees may do this. Every man's dreams comes true here. Electronics and other gimmicks worth tens of thousands of dollars everywhere. And another surprise awaits us, because this is not all of his office yet. we discover a cinema. For his Enterprise HQ, he especially bought the rights to the design from the owners. This place is not plagiarism made in China. Everything is authorized. But what does China's Captain Kirk look like? A young and hip startup type or simply a games nerd? In any case, he is a Chinese businessman worth billions. In the evening, he actually grants us one of his rare interviews. We are given 30 minutes with Liu Jichang. I have been a, uh, a fan for Star Trek for a long time. You know. uh, it, has, it has many different episodes, I mean, different, different uh, things. And uh, I think I almost watch every episode. So, you know, Star Trek has uh, uh, certainly, you know, I love it. His dream for the future is also of galactic scale. Well, if we think of big dreams, you know, sometimes people ask me, say, hey, DJ, do you want, do you want to make more money? I say, yes. And then <laughs> I say, yes. And I say, why? How can you spend all of them? I say, no problem. You know, think about building a space station. You know, if you think, think about that, then you know I don't have enough money to get it started yet. The important thing is that if you start doing something, you know, it gives you a, a small chance, at least, of doing something wonderful. And he has definitely proved this with the Chinese version of the Enterprise. Then we find another mysterious picture. Circular shapes right in the middle of a lake. Our research leads us to India. Already from the plane, we can see that we have come to the right place, directly on the border to Myanmar. But then suddenly the government takes our filming permit back without giving us a reason. So we need a plan B, as large parts of the lake are under military guard. So the boat is ready, shall we go? Yeah, okay, let's yeah, jump in. Please. Neve, our local contact, wants to take us there somehow unnoticed. This means that we have to go out onto Lake Loktak for over an hour. We learn that the government has officially banned fishing as well as living on the lake. The reason, it pollutes the nature reserve. Therefore, our image from above looks different. From the plane, we saw restricted military areas and we won't be able to go there. 
The circles used to be used as fish traps. Once they had swum into them, there was no escape for the animals. And the government is allowing certain areas and certain places where they can kill the fish. But the machine, we don't have any of the machine boat doing fishing here. This is entirely like what you have seen, like this boat kind of, yeah. boat, you know, that kind of the boat they can do fishing. But many residents refuse to leave and live far off from civilization on so-called fumdis. All naturally occurring, they consist of vegetation, soil and other organic matter. New islands keep developing, so to speak, out of tiny shreds of grass. This phenomenon is unique in the world. Uh, please come in, we'll, yeah. we'll uh, look inside. Yeah. Suman's family has been living here for two years. Their source of income used to be fishing. The government ban, a shock for them. Suman built the house himself from bamboo a semi-stable construction. But despite everything, he won't give up fishing. However, he doesn't use the classic round traps anymore. He has switched to a net. So that is the reason for our picture looking like this from above. The circles don't exist here anymore. And maybe the last inhabitants will even have to move away soon.